Dustin Martin is without a doubt one of this generation's greatest players with an unrivaled finals record and an ability to be one of the most offensively gifted midfielders of his generation. As we get closer and closer to his 300th game against my Hawks, I thought it would be time for a little retrospective. Lee Matthews at the start of 2018 called Dustin Martin's 2017 campaign one of the best individual seasons of all time, and it is hard to blame him. When Dusty won the 2017 Brownlow medal, he won it with the most votes that anyone had won the Brownlow medal with and genuinely dominated the competition. Whilst Dusty's prime wasn't just the 2017 campaign, I thought we could go back to that season and dissect not only just how good he was, but how he put together a season that is the envy of every other supporter in the competition. Dusty deserves to be celebrated. Regardless of what you think of Richmond, us as sports fans do not celebrate our legends anywhere near as much as we should. So, let's rectify that. Let's go through the 2017 season, and more importantly, how Dusty was one of the main catalysts in delivering Punt Road, a ground and drought-breaking premiership flag. Let's go. Don't forget to like the video. If you like the video, subscribe to join the Daz Talks Footy family. The last video I did, the Hawthorne one, is absolutely blown up, so thank you very much for that. But you can still do the same for this one. Get more people. Let's grow the Daz Talks Footy family almost at 3K. So let's get that going. With that shameless self-plug out of the way, let's get back to the retrospective attitude. And before we actually get to the 2017 campaign, I want to run you through just quickly how 2016 ended for the Tigers. In round 20 against Collingwood, they had a two and a half goal win. And for the last month of the season, didn't win at all, which culminated in a 115 point loss to Sydney at the SCG. And the major fallouts from this loss included three major factors. Firstly, kind of forgotten about, is that Dusty was getting approached by opposition clubs. Whilst most remember the GWS massive deal, at this point in time it was North Melbourne that were chasing at that point in time a 25-year-old Dusty as he was about to hit his absolute prime. And what a prime that ended up being. The second massive thing is that Richmond ended the 2016 season with eight wins. And at that point in time, one betting agency in Australia had them at $61 to win the flag. This really was an underdog story. But the third major factor concerned their coach. Has a club ever tried to forcibly get rid of or remove a coach like this in modern times? Well, ironically, Dusty is about to play his 300th game against Hawthorne, and arguably, Hawthorne were the last club to do this, with Jeff Kennett wanting Alastair Clarkson effectively coaching the twos before Hawthorne, ironically, took on Richmond in 2010. And current Hawthorne coach Sam Mitchell's tackle on the late Shane Tuck might have just ended up saving Alistair Clarkson's job. When it comes to Damien Hardwick in 2016, with the threat of a bored coup, an absolute tankover of this football club. However, Richmond stuck fat with Damien Hardwick and they would hit the 2017 season with a talented list with a flawed game plan. Damien Hardwick's been on record to say that they tried to be too much like Hawthorne at the time, where not only da uh, Damien Hardwick was an assistant coach throughout the 2008 Premiership season, but also the Hawks were just the best team at the time, with their elite kicking game and pressure forward of the ball being the two major reasons why they were such a good side, as well as their experienced campaigners being in the most damaging parts of the field. And But pressure became their biggest asset. And that came about because outside of Dustin Martin and maybe Basher Hawley, Richmond did not have good field kickers. It's why their Hawthorne-esque plan didn't work. They didn't have the ball users. So instead of trying to fix 
What they couldn't do, what led Richmond to being such a powerhouse, was Damian Hardwick focusing on what they could do. And what they could do was bring a minimum amount of effort. And that meant pressuring the ball carrier, getting their half forwards high up the ground, defending like hell and punishing on the scoreboard using some offensive weapons. Now, it wasn't just Dustin Martin who was such an offensive weapon, even though he was the best one. In my opinion, the two most underrated players from this dynasty were Kane Lambert and Shane Edwards, who were able to effectively, as a half forward flanker, and centre-half forward, both play elite defensive-based roles, Lambert at stoppage to let Dusty go free, and then forward of the ball to get more involved, whereas Edwards had to play continually above his height. But what both of these players had in spades was their footy IQ, two of the smartest footballers of their generation, and especially a guy like Kane Lambert, who I think outside of Richmond is one of the more underrated players I have seen. But as 2017 kicked off, no one could have seen what was coming at this point, and with a 26-year-old Dustin Martin ready to take the absolute piss, their campaign would begin against Carlton, and in round one, Dusty did that. He started the year with 33 disposals, and four goals. Yep, that's how his campaign began. And Richmond would go on an amazing run. They would win five in a row and indoctrinate themselves amongst the best teams in the competition at that time, being Adelaide and Geelong. And interestingly, after round five, with those three teams being undefeated, the entire top eight there would only have one change. The Western Bulldogs would drop out of the race being the reigning premier, and amazingly, Sydney being 0-5 and bottom of the ladder at that point would make the eight an extraordinary effort. But the Tigers were away, and it wasn't just round one in which his season started so beautifully. After 20-2 and two in round two, he fronted up against the West Coast and delivered this performance. 40 disposals, 15 clearances. Nine inside 50s and two goals. Seriously. And what if I told you that this wasn't his best performance for the year? But it really happened. And then after his quietest game of the season with just 16 disposals in round four, how does a player respond from that? Well, they do this. And it was simply amazing as Dusty was ready to absolutely tear the comp apart. He was the perfect candidate for a Brownlow vote getter, and he did it amazingly in 2016 as well, racking up the votes and finishing on the podium. It wasn't as if he was coming from the clouds, but given the fact that he didn't really need to tackle, although he did have a lot of games this year where he had four plus tackles, it wasn't as if he didn't do it. That just wasn't a part of his game. Everything he was doing was in space, was offensively minded, and his field kicking was fucking extraordinary. And those three things combined are so eye-catching, therefore, all he had to do was put in basically a B-plus performance, and he would get noticed. B-plus wasn't good enough for Dusty, as he continually put up performances like this one in round five. And at this point in time, if you weren't fully on the Tigers, you were kidding yourselves. However, much like some modern teams, Richmond would leave their fans a little bit frustrated after starting their season 5-0. Their next month would result in a 0-4 and four sky, a scoreline. However, at the end of those first nine rounds, Richmond was still in the eight. They didn't drop out of the eight at all in 2017. Part of that was the evenness of the competition, but banking those wins early in the season was absolutely key. In three out of those four losses, though, Dusty still took the piss. In their first loss of the year, Richmond took on eventual grand final opponents Adelaide, and for their first test against a top eight team, failed. But Dusty was still one of the better players on the ground and arguably Richmond's best player on the night as well. Things continued on from there, though, as he went into round seven, taking on the Bulldogs and putting up this kind of performance. And then after round eight, he looked at the Giants in round nine, and after an absolute thriller, ended his afternoon with these numbers. And you are kidding yourself if you're thinking that this is a fluke at this point. He was genuinely dominant. And what was so fun to watch 
as someone who likes to celebrate the stars, is that his game, it's not that it was flawless, but everything you could find wrong with his game, if you were that kind of person, became instantly invalidated because of how dominant he was with ball in hand. Sure, he wasn't running back to full back to help out Rance and these kind of guys. He didn't need to, because if it was from defensive 50 to the goal line, you effectively were stuffed. That's how good it was. And that game against the Giants is extraordinary. You might have noted at this point that I am including his contested possession numbers, and you might be wondering why. Well, here is the bonkers stat that will help you understand. Dusty had three more contested possessions for the entire season than he had uncontested. And when you think of the greatest players of the modern generation, and I think of him Gary Ablett Jr. and Chris Judd as those players that stand maybe a tier above other midfielders of their time as individuals, their ability to get the ball from contest to the outside and create plays effectively is what made them so bloody good. And this was no different in the first year, well, you could argue second year, of Dusty's true prime. 20 contested possessions in a 35 disposal game is batshit incredible stuff but it didn't end there as the tigers hoped for some consistency In dream time at the G, Richmond had to get back on the winner's list and it wasn't pretty, but an 81 to 66 point win over the Red and Black was enough to get them back onto the winner's list with Dusty putting up another good performance. Now between a couple of games that were still really good and the bye, we're going to skip to round 14 where Richmond took on Carlton again. Now if you've already forgotten, this is what he did in round one. This is an impossible standard for anyone to maintain. And to Carlton's credit, he didn't kick a goal. He still did this though, putting up 30 disposals, plenty of clearances and plenty of inside 50s as the Tigers were starting to rumble. He then decided he wasn't going to have back-to-back poor performances and decided to beat the living piss out of Port Adelaide with those numbers as well, before one of the more defining moments of the season. At this point in time, Richmond being a contender or pretender was very much up in the air, with footy shows at the time being divided over the issue. And it seemed like the messaging was clear. St Kilda were ripe for the picking. It was Marvel Stadium. And if for those of you that don't remember, this is what happened. It was over 80 points the difference at half time and Richmond had kicked one goal four. And then from here, most of the media talk was about the pretender status. Richmond had two interstate teams next, Brisbane and GWS. Now they would go on to win both of those games, a true sign of some maturity, especially with the Giants as they were a very good team. However, you need to feel sorry for Brisbane a little bit. St Kilda have just kicked Richmond's ass. Dusty is one of the best players in the competition, if not the outright number one at this point. All you need to do is to ensure that he doesn't play one of the best games of the season. And unfortunately for Brisbane, they didn't do that, with Dusty putting up these genuinely ridiculous numbers. If anyone can find a better game he played that year, it could be the West Coast game. It absolutely could be. I would argue it's not the case. 40 disposals, 14 clearances, 12 inside 50s, and still hit the scoreboard. That! is impact per possession. So surely he took it easy on the Giants the next week, right? Nope, he did this. Uh, yeah, that's uh, quite scary to think that out of two weeks, you could argue that GWS did a good job. He didn't play as well. There's also the argument to be made that a performance like that deserves all six Brownlow votes. Think of it as you will. 
but an extraordinary performance by Dusty there. He didn't stop either by beating the piss out of Gold Coast the very next week as well, putting together one of the better three-week runs we've seen in modern times, especially from midfielders. Everyone knew that Dusty was so hard to tackle. In fact, in his 299 games, and this is via the midweek rub on Triple M, Dusty has broken nearly 400 tackles in his career. And you think of someone who's broken tackles a lot in the last two years, Hawthorne's Jai Newcomb, in his last 35 games, has broken 39. So if you consider that to be one and a seventh every game, so it's about 1.14 a game. For 300 games, that would be 321 broken tackles for an entire career. Dusty at 299 is near the 385 mark. It's genuinely stupid how hard this guy was to tackle. Now in round 20, his fortune continued as Richmond went on to beat my Hawks, unfortunately, but when they were this good, Northorn were that bad, well, what can you say at that point in time? Before Richmond went through their last loss of 2017 in round 21 against the Swans as they charged towards September, coming from an 0-7 start to end up winning a final, which is still crazy when you think about it. So, were there still some scars there for the Tigers? With only a fortnight to go before the finals? Were they still heavily behind Adelaide, and Geelong? These were fair questions at the time. You can only beat who's in front of you, of course, but considering Dusty put up this performance with a fortnight to go towards the finals, and then after their week break, did that to finish the home and away season, his Brownlow medal was confirmed, and we were watching a modern superstar. Now, as I've said before in the video, I think we hate on our legends way too much. I am one of them, and there is something in the 2017 discussion that I need to call myself out for, and I'm going to do that. And on reflection as we get here seven years later, it is extraordinary to think that even as non-Richmond fans, we don't celebrate these types of performances enough, in my opinion. Now, there is also a really selfish reason that I am doing this video, and that is, I don't remember 2017 all that much at all. And I don't mean I wasn't watching footy at the time. I don't even mean footy. I meant me, myself, my brain. 2017 is basically gone from my memory. I'll explain as shortly as I can. From mid-2017 to mid-December 2017, I had a total of six eye surgeries. Three of them were single eye, three of them were double eye, so both eyes were operated on at the same time. That much anaesthetic can cause a little bit of memory loss. It has. Seven years later, the entirety of that kind of calendar year is just gone to me. There's not a whole lot there in the slightest. I didn't watch the 2017 Grand Final live. I'd had a double eye surgery two days beforehand, and I had gauze and bandages over both of them. I sat with the girl I was dating at the time's dad while he watched it, the commentary was on full blast, and I got to basically imagine a grand final. It's also why I wasn't really that passionate about the clash trip because I wasn't watching it anyway. And being able to reflect on these games, I don't remember watching them live. I've gone back and watched as much as the highlights as I can. I really have. And look, there are some things you remember more fondly than others, for sure. But this is as cathartic an experience for me as hopefully it is for you, whether you're a Richmond fan or not. But what he was able to do in this was extraordinary. Now, Richmond from 1980 to 2016 were your laughing stock, really, a true laughing stock. Now, 1981 and 1982, they played in grand finals both against Carlton and lost them. So we can eliminate those from the conversation. But Richmond were never really great and were rarely good. They were tossing aside coaches like nobody's business. They barely had superstars at that time. And apart from 2001, where they made a preliminary final, they never threatened, really. And 10 minutes into the prelim against Brisbane, it was clear they weren't going to win that game anyway. They were always the constant butt of just outside the eight. The ninth men's jokes ran rife throughout the footy community. But a club and a supporter base 
that finally deserved some joy were third on the ladder, who rocked up to a qualifying final against Geelong as the underdogs and beat them. Dusty's night read thusly, and it was time for the prelims. And they would face GWS, with Adelaide taking on Geelong in the other prelim. Adelaide beat the Cats, and it was up to the Tigers to take on the Giants. Now, for some stupid reason, now seven years later, this preliminary final really is remembered for what Trent Cotchin did to Dylan Shield. Well, we can still bitch and moan about that all we want to, but... It happened, he wasn't suspended, and we go through with it. Dusty did this on preliminary final day and genuinely took the piss, as did Richmond throughout the majority of that game. And from a couple of people who I know that were there, was one of the more electric atmospheres. I'd love to say I know I wasn't there, and I don't really feel like lying to you in any of my videos, let alone this one. But they were through. Their first grand final since 1982. And against an opponent at that point, who were without a doubt the best home and away team. The Crows just were and dominated both finals, and with their power stance, were ready to take on the Tigers. Now, just quickly, I don't actually have a problem with the power stance, I actually really liked it, on reflection. It's one of those things that worked twice in finals, yet we criticise them for it not working on grand final day. Now, we know everything that happened with Adelaide post that 2017 grand final, but I actually feel like we've memed the power stance a bit too much. Richmond were just dominant on the day. The power stance were not why Adelaide lost. But if you don't think I'm going to show grand final highlights there, well, you must be new here. Enjoy. Now, one of the major advantages that Richmond had in this game, and you could argue the same thing for the Crows as well, but they didn't really have anyone scarred from previous Richmond failures. Sure, they'd lost a few finals coming in and they still had this chokers mentality, but when it came to the actual final itself, the grand final, they'd broken through that barrier. It was a clean slate. They were one of the most relaxed teams watching the game back that I've seen in quite a while. They were not flustered, especially in that second half, as they kicked away. And Dusty's numbers were extraordinary. The drought was over. The 2017 flag was headed to Punt Road. Brendan Gale was an absolute genius. Damian Hardwick was the best coach of the year. Trent Cotchin was the next premiership captain. And Dustin Martin was the Norm Smith medalist. And here is a moment of self-reflection. 
both passionately and non-passionately, depending on who I'm talking to, I've always stated that Basha Hawley was the best player on the ground in 2017. Where I've kind of had to mature as a footy fan is realizing that doesn't actually matter. Now, does the Norm Smith add to his legacy? Yes. Do I blame the judges for getting on board the train? Not really. Not with those numbers, what he'd done. It completely made sense that the guy that stood out and did so much got the award. And I don't think Basha was... 50%, 150% better than Dusty, I get why he was awarded it. It helps. His legacy is great. Legacy is such a cool thing in sport and something to be celebrated. So whilst, yes, I'll continually give Richmond fans shit quietly amongst my mates about the Basher v Dusty debate, overall, it doesn't mean jack. So 2017 was done and dusted. And of course, well, Dusty, you could say, but also 2019, he would win another Norm Smith. Basher was very good in that game as well. And in 20, he was so far the best player. It was ridiculous. But this 2017 retrospective, I hope, can help us celebrate our champions a little bit better. And as we hit Dusty's 300th game, like I think he would enjoy, not that he would ever watch this video, is whilst, yes, it's a reflection about him, it wasn't all on him. From anyone who I've spoken to, including two people that worked at the Richmond Footy Club in the late 2010s, Dusty, like someone like a Lance Franklin, are both very shy in the limelight and a ridiculously good teammate. He nearly went to North, he toured GWS, and he is now a yellow and black Richmond icon. He's a star, he's a legend, he'll be remembered for it forever, and maybe we'll never see him again post-retirement. And you know what? That's fine. Because when we did get to see him, and we will again on Saturday, we will remember an absolute champion, a Richmond icon, an AFL legend. So hats off to you, Dustin Martin, for your 300th game on Saturday. And two things can be true at once. I hope you're celebrated forever, and I hope the Hawks kick your ass. Thank you for watching. Like the video if you like the video. Subscribe to join the Daz Talks footy family. Comment below. I love interacting with you guys about all your thoughts, some thoughts, what you agree with, what you disagree with about the video. I hope you have a fantastic weekend. Go the Hawks over the week, of course. And until next time, stay safe, stay bloody wonderful because you're an absolute legend. And I'll see you next time.